What comes to mind when we think of fire? Do we think of a destructive force with a mind of its own that ravages homes and forests? Thousands of years ago, man used fire as a management tool. And today we're coming full circle because in nature, fire brings forth an abundance of flourishing life to what little is left of North America prairies. Once an area burns, it comes back much more vibrant and full of life than it was before it burned. Woolsey really has some uh, interesting and unique species that have largely disappeared from this part of the country. Because this is a piece of public land, it means that it's open to all citizens. It really has shown me that there's so much more uh, to learn in an environment like this. I guess say present a complete package to the next generation that comes along. It was my interest in the history of prairies that actually gave me a vision of how the ecological restoration at Woolsey Wet Prairie should be. It's a basic ecological design concept that it's much easier to design and build something uh, when you're trying to put something back like it originally was and trying to make it something totally different just simply doesn't work. That's basically a fruitless struggle. And so our design team put a lot of thought into how we wanted to design Woolsey Wet Prairie. We didn't want a flat bottom wetland cell. We wanted a lot of natural features in it. And we had to look at what it would take to make that happen. And so uh, my philosophy was basically that it was vital to look in the past in order to move into the future with our design of Woolsey Wet Prairie. Tallgrass Prairie ecosystem evolved with fire. Fire is an integral part of that ecosystem. Um, these landscapes burned regularly um, since for tens of thousands of years, uh, both from natural or lightning set fires and also uh, by human set fires. Native Americans have used fires to manage these uh, ecosystems for probably about 12,000 years. So fire is something that's happened in some cases annually in some cases every two or three years on these landscapes. And all the plants and animals native to the tall grass prairie ecosystem uh, are fire adapted. And uh, in fact, they need fire either for some part of their life cycle or to maintain their open habitat. What happens if, if there's no fire is very quickly you get trees uh, coming in and it quickly turns into a forest. And so you really need these periodic fires to maintain the open habitats, maintain the vegetation that likes these prairie type habitats, um, and make it suitable for these species that are prairie, uh, prairie specialists. And so um, many of these species without fire uh, would disappear. We want to eliminate as many of the invasive species as we can and have it be the natural species that grew here actually by themselves. They were spontaneous growth. And what the fire can do is it can burn back the fescue and the, the, the non-native species. It'll burn them all back to a point. But we try to burn those back before the, uh, the, the plants go to seed so that the dormant plants don't get damaged. The plants that came up early in the spring, the fescue being a prime example, get damaged before they go to seed so they can't repopulate. And then the other plants will come back afterward. Prairie is the term that we use to describe the massive expansive grassland that once extended through the middle of North America. When most people hear the word prairie they think of the Great Plains. But there were actually at one time prairies that extended as far east as the Mississippi River. Many people in Arkansas don't realize that at one time we even had a considerable amount of prairie here in Arkansas. and People don't know it because it's almost extinct in our state but we had a lot of acreage of prairie. And we get enough rainfall in Arkansas that you would expect uh, forest to be found on the landscape. So where you do have prairie, there's something going on uh, with the soil or with other ecosystem processes like fire that keep the prairie prairie. It's kind of a tug of war between encroaching forest and the prairie being open. 
So the main process is fire. Uh, we are able to put fire on the landscape at a frequent enough interval that the trees that come up are burned down to the ground and the grasses have a competitive advantage over the, the woody vegetation. One reason I prefer a spring burn is uh, I would like to see more grasses out there, the native prairie grasses like the big blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass. We already have a multitude of species of forbs, which are the broadleaf plants as opposed to the grasses. And uh, so that's one reason I like to do a spring burn. Another reason is there's kind of a downside of a fall burn because you go out there in October and November and after a burn, that ground is going to be blackened all winter long. And so basically a, a lot of migratory species, in particular birds that are coming through, uh, some of them do like uh, post-burn areas, but the majority of them don't. And so they don't have any cover from predators. Their food sources are limited. The platter's basically bare all winter long. And the predator species don't go there because there's no prey species for them to hunt. So it's kind of a lose-lose a uh, scenario because the cupboard is bare and uh, really doesn't have anything to offer to predators that are looking for prey. So that's one of the downsides of the fall burn. In contrast, the spring burn offers bare ground that, that really happens just before the start of the growing season. And so consequently that dark ground, you have a, a period, a much shorter period in the year where you have blackened bare earth. And as you're coming into the spring and the ground warms up faster because everything's been removed in the spring, things are about ready to pop up and start turning green and that black ground absorbs a lot of heat. And what that does, it gives those native plants a jump start. They can start coming out and growing earlier. When Congress passed the Clean Water Act, it mandated that there shall be no net loss of wetlands in the United States. Therefore, we have construction projects today that have adverse impact on wetlands, and those projects are required to do things to offset the impacts to wetlands. This can include restoration of existing wetlands and or creation of new wetlands. It started out, we had to build a wetlands. But what happened is we went in and we, as we built our wastewater plant and had soil left over, we used that soil from this site to build the berms to create the wetlands. So that instead of having to haul the soil away to a spoil site somewhere, we just hauled it right next door, built these berms, and saved a great, great deal of money by doing that. And the next step was to have in water control structures that interconnected the berms so that we could trap some water into the wet areas and the ponded areas of the wetlands. Once we did that, we planned to do a contract in order to plant a lot of wetlands plants because we didn't think that it would happen by itself. Because we had to wait a certain amount of time after we had the berms built, when we awarded that contract and before we actually had the contractor up working to plant the seeds for the wetlands plants, we went out and did a second inventory of our plants. What we discovered is that the plant population had doubled between our first inventory before any work was done and our second inventory the wetlands was recreating itself. When we built this new wastewater treatment plant, the, the west side plant in the Illinois River drainage, some wetlands were lost in the process of building that plant. But the mitigation for the loss created this public land and helped preserve this property. We had a uh, great design team uh, to do Woolsey Wet Prairie. We basically had to do it. Uh, the city of Fayetteville was required to generate credits wetland mitigation credits because some low quality wetlands were impacted by the construction of the massive wastewater systems improvement project and so I had a great opportunity to work with people from the city of Fayetteville and uh, McGoon Williams Jade's consulting engineers and as we did this design we had to come up with you know what is a potential cost for it and that included not only constructing the earthen berms but also the initial kickoff of the management of it such as seeding and uh, the first prescribed burn and then we would kind of wait and see what management was needed in subsequent years. That was the general game plan. And so it was a really good thing because uh, our construction budget to do all these things and build it and have multiple contractors do things was a little over $400,000 and the actual costs were 
about $132,000. We uh, consequently had a savings close to $290,000 coming in under these contract uh, estimated opinions of probable cost. Among the things that provided these savings was we built the berms, we removed the cattle, we saw this immediate change and we actually had awarded a bid to this contractor to come in for $150,000 and do our initial burn and then plant all of these very expensive prairie seeds. And as we continued our plan inventories, we started things, seeing things coming back and coming back and it, it's like, wow, this was just, they were all asleep. And, and seven years later after our monitoring, we're still seeing it. And it's like all these native plants were asleep, just laying there waiting for something to happen, waiting for somebody to help them release something that was inhibiting them and, and give them a chance. Uh, so we found a, a wide variety of species here already and we're only really just starting to uncover the, the biodiversity of reptiles and amphibians that are here. Um, there's a variety of species that are found in a, a wide variety of habitats, but they're most common in these prairie type of habitats, things like prairie king snakes, uh, leopard frogs, uh, narrow mouth toads, and some of our other uh, things like box turtles that, that live in a variety of habitats. But then we've also found some real prairie specialists that uh, are really only found in this type of habitat. So one of those is uh, called the smallmouth salamander. This is a, it's about a six inch long, uh, dark, almost blue gray colored salamander that most people have never even heard of, let alone seen. They spend 99.9% .9 of their life buried underground. And they only emerge for a short period in the spring when heavy rainstorms trigger them to come out and breed. And what they really need to breed in are temporary water bodies, little temporary wetlands or ditches. And the most important thing is that those wetlands don't have fish because one bass in those wetlands will eat all of the salamander larvae that get laid. So some of these wetlands here at, at uh, Woolsey Wet Prairie are really beautiful in that respect. They have no fish, they're ephemeral, they stay filled for a few months, which is just about the right period of time for these salamanders to develop. And so uh, we were actually out here in February, one of these big rainy nights, and sure enough, all the salamanders were marching out across the, uh, the landscape here, moving towards these wetlands that actually at that point hadn't even filled yet. They were actually making their way to the places where the water was gonna fill up. And now they've laid their eggs and the larvae are developing in these wetlands. So over the next couple of months, the larvae will grow till they're about two or three inches long, and then uh, eventually metamorphose and go bury themselves back up in the woods. Well, it's very interesting. There have been a number of rare birds documented at Woolsey Wet Prairie. Um, I'll start with one that's not so rare, but rarely found, and that's Nelson Sparrow. It's a marsh sparrow. A lot of people don't find them because they don't go walking around in the marshes, but we've now found them during migration every year at Woolsey Wet Prairie, and sometimes as many as three or four in a day. And those are really unusual records for Arkansas and really any place in migration in the central U.S. But we've also found some birds. Uh, one, for example, uh, Mike Mladenov found Brewer Sparrow here, which is a fairly common bird further west, but it had never before been documented in Arkansas. And he also, Mike also found a bird called Cason Sparrow, uh, which is a fairly common bird out west, but it had only been seen in Arkansas in one other place. And so Woolsey, because the habitat is in good condition and it's being managed well with prescribed fire and efforts to restore it, uh, has been a real magnet for all kinds of rare birds. To date, over 20 species of shorebirds, such as freshwater sandpipers, have been seen at Woolsey Wet Prairie, along with numerous songbirds, it's a great place to go see hawks, or various other types of wading birds that wade out in the standing water. Woolsey Wet Prairie has several records of unusual birds, including county and state records of species never seen in this area before. Today I was out uh, when I first got here, uh, kind of going around the edge and, and looking for non-native invasives, and I, I flushed a covey of quail. And uh, the quail like to feed on a lot of the native prairie plants that have a hard uh, seed. Uh, some of the native legumes, also the ragweeds and some of the composites or sunflower family species. Uh, there are a bunch of milkweeds uh, at Woolsey Wet Prairie and those are very important uh, group of plants for insects. So we have um, a lot of um, milkweed, beetles, 
We have a lot of butterfly species here, including the monarch, which has as its host plant uh, any of our native milkweeds. So there's a lot of interconnectedness between the plant species and the animal species on the site. My favorite thing when I come here are the crawfish chimneys. And I know all of you who have to mow lawns in these low wet places are really gonna be cussing me now because I love the crawfish chimneys. But we have a, an unusual crawfish here. It's, it's an endemic species. That means that it only lives in a, in a restricted area, in a few counties in this area. And that crawfish lives here at Woolsey Wet Prairie and it puts up chimneys that look like skyscrapers. And that's because they're burrowing down into the water table. And I love to come here and see the crawfish chimneys. Another rare species we found here is called a Graham's crayfish snake. So this is a small aquatic snake uh, that is found uh, fairly widely in the U.S., but it's mostly found in the coastal plain and in the prairies further west of here. So in Arkansas, there's actually a huge chunk of basically the whole north central to northwestern part of the state where the species has, has very seldom been recorded. And in fact, the only records are just a couple of museum specimens that were collected back in the 1950s. In fact, those don't even have the data to know exactly where they came from. And uh, we were out here a few weeks ago and sure enough turned up a uh, Graham's crayfish snake, which is really not surprising. This is a, a highly aquatic species and they're actually unique among these uh, aquatic snakes because they feed exclusively on crayfish. Uh, virtually the only thing they eat is crayfish and even more so than that, the only thing they eat are soft-shelled, newly molted crayfish. Um, so they sniff around in the water and smell out a crayfish that's all soft, that has just shed its, its skin, and that's about the only thing they eat. Um, so this, these are the first records in the whole north central and northwestern part of the state uh, in the last 50 or 60 years. Today is kind of a, a milestone in the botany of Woolsey Wet Prairie in that we, for the first time, uh, broke 400 uh, species, the number of plant species that we found on the site today went from uh, 397 to 401. And this is a particularly interesting species that was first found on the site today. It's called sleepy catchfly. And uh, it's a native prairie plant. It is very unusual in that it has these dark purple bands of very sticky um, glue-like goo on them that catch bugs. There's a roly-poly or a um, little isopod there and it's another insect of some kind stuck in it here and it's not a carnivorous plant so it's not trapping them to eat them but the, the belief is that this species catches these bugs on the stem to keep them from going up and uh, eating, destroying the seeds. Uh, it's really just one of the many fascinating uh, plant species in our native prairie ecosystem. This is an IBA area, um, important bird area, and uh, that's a national designation that we have out there. There is, there is 80, I believe, 80 different species of birds that you can see. You can see cardinals, you can see hawks, you can see uh, uh, swallowtails out there, and it's it's a. Uh, and, and, it's just a beautiful place. Not only do you can look at the plants, you can look at the, the bird species, you can look at the wildlife, you'll see turtles, you'll see fox, you'll see deer. To qualify as an important bird area, a site has to support species of conservation interest. This means species that have rapidly declining populations. So since 2006, I've done the vegetation monitoring here at Woolsey Prairie. And for the first five years, we did really intensive quantitative monitoring where we have 47 plots set up here. Each of those had four subplots and we quantitatively measured uh, the percentage cover of every plant species in those plots. We did that twice a year for those five years and saw the changes, measured the changes over time. Uh, now we're done with the restoration phase, we're in the maintenance phase, and the monitoring has shifted. It's kind of an, a, a more abbreviated monitoring where we come twice a year, record the total number of species in each of the seven wetland cells, and then um, document the locations of any invasive species. 
uh, for the management team to come and, and, and take care of those problem species. We're going to shift away from the annual burning uh, once we do the expansion of Woolsey Wet Prairie and you know we have 40 acres now, roughly 43 acres, and once we enlarge it to 140 acres, we're going to start shifting around and doing this uh, mosaic burn where we'll have certain units set up that will burn on two and three year rotations. And so what that's going to do is greatly increase the diversity of the plant species. They'll all kind of, each unit will kind of be at a different a, a stage of succession, but it will also control the woody stuff that's trying to come up. And that's basically the way the Indians did it. They would burn an area one year, knowing the bison and the elk would migrate. It would essentially make a, a food plot. And then the next year they might burn another area because the migrating uh, large herbivores would be attracted to that area instead of the area that had been burned two or three years ago. So that's kind of the, the general game plan we have, and uh, I am convinced that will hugely add to the diversity of the plants and the wildlife that live at Woolsey Wet Prairie. Uh, and so another thing it will add is because you're not burning every site every year and you're, you're shifting around and burning them every two or three years, each management unit as, as I'll call it, more fuel is allowed to build up because you're not burning it back. And, and so there will be more vegetation growing up. And so instead of burning it every year, you come in there every two or three years, there will be a lot of fuel from that native vegetation that's died back. Therefore, our fires will be hotter and more thorough. One of our dreams <clears throat> in a few years, we're hoping to essentially take the wetlands in its state that it's in right now. We do hope to expand it. And we want to play, overlay a park, essentially overlay it right on top of the wetlands where we make the tops of the berms walking trails. And this would be walking only. If, so we, we'll take the wetlands with the berms turn the berms into walking trails where people can easily navigate throughout the area, build a parking area that's suitable for that, and then manage it both as a natural park and as a wetlands. My involvement with Wolseley started, has started maybe in the past two years, and it has, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, just flooded even my experience with all kinds of new aspects. Uh, regarding the different types of native vegetation, you know, that are trying to be encouraged uh, in this area, um, the different types of uh, invasive, you know, non-native um, plants that grow out here, the just huge variety of birds that you'll find year-round. I mean, I've had afternoons in January where it was 25 degrees and, you know, I mean, I was just chilled to the bone and yet you can't hardly keep track of the uh, you know, different types of you know, raptors and uh, other little sparrows that are in the area. Um, so yeah, I guess for someone who uh, before experiencing Wolseley Wetlands would have said that they knew a lot about you know, uh, the outdoors, it really has shown me that there's so much more uh, to learn in, in an environment like this. Uh, well, I think it's, it's fantastic to have this beautiful uh, piece of, of uh, restored and, and uh, beautiful prairie habitat right here so close to Fayetteville. Uh, for me personally, as a professor at U of A, it means I have a place that I can take students to show them a remnant of what a lot of the landscape around here used to be like and should be like uh, without having to travel miles and miles away. And uh, this is actually going to be a, a wonderful outdoor classroom that we can use to show students, ecology students, biology students, uh, some of the unique animals and habitats we have here and illustrate some of the, the important ways that these habitats need to be managed. For instance, uh, how prescribed fire can be used to uh, maintain these habitats. The tall grass prairies are all but gone. 99% or more uh, of the original tall grass prairies we had in Arkansas have been destroyed. Uh, Fayetteville was built in a large tall grass prairie uh, area or ecosystem here in northwest Arkansas, both in Washington and Benton counties, where hundreds of thousands of acres of, of treeless prairie historically. Uh, almost every bit of it's gone, so having Woolsey Prairie right here in Fayetteville is a rare opportunity for the people here to see 
a missing piece of their natural heritage. For me as a birder, of course, I really enjoy seeing the open country birds. And I like the chance to come to what's left of this uh, seasonal wetland habitat in, in the Ozarks. I was the project manager on this whole project, the Greater Wastewater Project, including the Woolsey Wet Prairie. And there's a lot of parts of that that are enormous successes, and I take very personal pride in that. It wasn't my design. Most of it wasn't my work, but I was integral to the team that made it all happen. So there's, there's a lot of personal pride in a beautiful success that can, that can serve our citizens in so many ways, from the revenue stream it's creating, from the beauty that it's creating, from the enhancement of nature, from the, the enhancement of what we can learn from this. University students, high school students come out here and can learn a great deal right in this one location. Had we not done this project, had we not done this work, they wouldn't have that opportunity. So many things enter my mind uh, when I think about Woolsey Wet Prairie and, and what it means to me. It, you know, it, I've been involved in it so much it means a multitude of things. It, Woolsey Wet Prairie to me is like uh, an ecological oasis for plants and animals and people. And uh, it's just been a, a pretty awesome experience to, think, to see things that have transpired at Woolsey Wet Prairie. It's not whether the city's going to grow, or the region's going to grow, but how do we grow it? How do, preserve, how do we preserve what we have uh, and, and, and maintain that for the next generations to come on so we don't lose something that we've had? You can't lose that. They, it, it's important that, that our children and our children's children understand what our, what our heritage is, what our what our makeup was and is, and who we are, and, and where we've been, and where we're going, and to keep that all, uh, you know, together, so we can, I guess, say, present a complete package to the next generation that comes along.